Hello, everyone, and welcome. Thank you for attending today's webinar, Segregation in Bulk Silos, What is Really Happening? This webinar is sponsored by Beauregard Lignotech and presented by Watt Global Media. I'm Jackie Remke, editor of Feed Management and Feed International Magazines, and I will be your moderator this morning. Before we start, I'd like to mention that the question and answer segment will be held at the end of today's presentation. Please feel free to submit your questions during the webinar. Your submissions will remain anonymous to the rest of the audience and will only be visible to the moderator and speakers. We will answer as many questions as we can within the time allotted. This webinar is being recorded and will be available to view as an archive at www.watagnet.com forward slash webinars. We plan to schedule several, several webinars later this year. To register for upcoming webinars, view an archive of today's webinar, or see on-demand webinars on related topics, please visit www.watagnet.com forward slash webinars. Please note that the speaker presentations are available for download. Please visit http forward slash forward slash response.lignotechfeed.com forward slash webinar dash watt agnet dash free presentations to download your copy of speaker presentations today. During the webinar, a poll question will be pushed out to the audience. We would greatly appreciate everyone's response. Finally, please note that at the conclusion of today's webinar, there will be a brief survey. Please consider taking a minute to complete it. Our sponsor for today is Beauregard Lignotech. Beauregard Lignotech is the world's leading supplier of lignin-based pelleting aids to the feed industry. The company has a global presence with eight manufacturing plants on four continents and sales offices worldwide. For additional information on other products and services offered by Beauregard Lignotech, please visit www.lignotechfeed.com. Today, we are joined by Tom Winowiski and Joe Moritz. Tom Winowiski has a master's degree in organic chemistry from Michigan Technological University. He has 38 years of experience in industrial research in the animal feed industry with an emphasis on pellet quality in North and South America, Europe, Southeast Asia, and Australia. He holds six feed-related patents, four of which are unique commercial products currently used in the feed industry. In his role as Technical Application Manager at Beauregard Lignotech, Winna Whiskey is also frequently at work in feed mills to demonstrate the benefits of the company's lignin-based pelleting aids. Joe Moritz was trained in nutrition and feed manufacture at Ohio State and Kansas State Universities. He joined the faculty at West Virginia University in 2002 and currently holds the rank of full professor. Moritz maintains a 45% research, 30% teaching, and 25% extension appointment. His primary research focus is on nutritional consequences of feed manufacture. Moritz's laboratory has published over 50 peer-reviewed journal articles and presented research at numerous regional, national, and international meetings. He has been the major advisor to 24 students that have earned their Master's of Science and three students that have earned their PhD. Moritz continues to lead an active student-centered research program. And now I'll hand the webinar over to Tom. Well, good morning or good afternoon, wherever you may be. Um, this is Tom Winowiski and I just want to put the map up here to reemphasize that Beauregard is spread across the globe and we have uh, some offices in South America as well and over the past 38 years I've worked in most of these places and much of the time uh, working in feed mills running pelleting trials and we of course do pellet durabilities and uh, at the end of the trial we'll sit down with the management and discuss what we've learned and I often get very frustrated because they say pellet durability tests are irrelevant. The results don't correlate to the finds we find at the feeder. And after
after all the work I've done, this kind of makes me crazy. So that's the real story behind why I initiated this investigation. Um, we started at uh, a Turkey Feed Mill in Minnesota, and uh, we were testing 1% calcium lignosulfonate versus no binder, and we pelletized the feed under similar conditions and sent them out to the silo at the farm and then we sacked off all the feed and we measured the fines in every tenth bag of feed. And you can see the green line is with the lignin sulfonate. Uh, the pellet durability was 86 and we were delivering out of the silo about 90 percent pellets. The control pellet, the durability was 77 and we were delivering about 75 percent pellets. So the durability test is not an exact predictor, but it's a relative predictor. But of more concern to me was the shifting of the percentage of pellets coming out of the silo. Now we did this uh, with each formulation that we sent out. So in all, we had 12 batches of feed that we sacked off and did durabilities on. And when we plotted the average fines out of the silos as a function of the pellet durability, there was a very strong correlation. So I use this to, uh, as evidence that the pellet durability test can be a predictor of the actual amount of pellets delivered to the field. This was done more recently uh, by West Virginia University and they made uh, six different feeds and they tested durability three times each um, at, the, at the feed mill using the standard Kansas State tumbler, the modified tumbler with five hex nuts in it, or the new Holman portable tester. And then they measured fines at the field. This uh, very simple graph just shows that the uh, feed quality, the pellet quality was very consistent across the different feed rations. The top blue line is a Kansas State tumbler giving about 95 durability, predicting very low fines delivered. Then the modified test uh, about 90 durability and then the new Holman tester is the gray line at the bottom with about 82. Now, even though pellet durability was 95 in one test and 82 in another, it's the same pellets. It's just one test is more aggressive than another. So then <clears throat> they went out to the farm and they sampled uh, at the drop spout coming out of the silo. Rather than sample at the feeders when the birds have had a chance to, to take pellets out, they just opened this drop spout and collected a complete sample there. And of course, the correlation with pellet durability was wonderful. Not. <laughs> this is what people have said to me. You know, you do these durability tests, but this is the result I get out in the field. It's all over the place. And if you think back to empty, emptying the complete silo, as we did in Minnesota, if we would have taken a sample from this blue line, at the beginning, we think we had wonderful pellet quality, but if at the end we've got only 60% uh, pellets, it's the same feed. So I wanted to somehow do something that could show people what's actually going on in these silos. So we're going to try to bring up a video um, and show how segregation occurs in a silo. Now the, the quality of this image is not so great. Uh, you can get a much better uh, image by going online. But what we see here is um, layer crumbles that have been loaded into a bin and they're, um, every 25% we've thrown in a, a level of rabbit pellets just to contrast. And when the bin unloads, um, you can see it unloads from the center and the sides don't move at all. Now we're going to actually see those pellets come out. 
Now the fines, you can see layers of fines that are lighter colored than the crumbles. That's going to show up in Joe's presentation as well, where fines will be a solid and light color. We see a slug of pellets coming down the center. Those have rolled off the top. So we're unloading from the center and from the top, and the sides are completely stationary. They're not unloading at all. Now, what if we stop unloading and the truck shows up with another batch of feed? Now, in this case, it's weird because I put in rabbit pellets for contrast, and you can see a central column of fines uh, going right up the center and we're going to unload this second feed now we get a little bit of layer crumb out and then the central column unloads again that has the fines in it you can see the pellets rolling down from the top now clean pellets rolling down from the top and filling in that vortex and exiting you call this rat holing or channeling or chimney flow or whatever you call it but the silo is actually unloading from the top and the sides haven't moved and now at the end when you think everything's good suddenly you get the layer crumbs out and people are scratching their head what, what, what happened here and if this is a medicated feed you know it could really be a problem so initially we got uh, very low pellets and that was the layer crumbs and we should see a red arrow showing up at that. And then we got um, uh, about 60% pellets, and that was the central column unloading that has higher fines. Then we went through a transition period, and we got 90% pellets, which are the clean pellets rolling off the top. And then at the end, big surprise, we go back to layer crumbs. So always unload your silos completely whenever possible. And that, that's the end of this video. We'll try to transition back into the slideshow. Okay, we had a little, uh, a little problem here in that um, the first video was actually supposed to be the second video. So this is a prequel now. <laughs> the second video will show this silo where we have 10% fines, 30% fines, and 50% fines. And you can see as we empty it and move to the right, um, we're always emptying that second column out, uh, that center column out, and delivering uh, clean pellets at the end. If we plot those, in this case, about the first half of the bin has a lower percentage of pellets. That represents the central column. And then at the end, the second half, we get the clean pellets that have come from the sides of the bin. If this were a bigger silo, the central column would represent a smaller proportion, and maybe only 20% would be high in fines, and the rest would be cleaner. But I think the general, general principle applies here. Now, not every silo is loaded directly from the top center. Um, here we've shot the load into the side, and you can see the fines have stayed right where they've landed. Uh, particularly in the upper left-hand corner, you can see with 10% fines, they're all over there on that right side. As we empty the silo, once again, it empties from the center and takes off from the top, but it's now feeding both fines and pellets. So it's a mixture in this case. One last thing, um, at the very bottom, uh, below the bear, you can see on the bottom row there's more fines than pellets. It's kind of leaning to the right a little bit. That's because the pellets flow more easily than the fines, so you're going to get a little shift in that output. Looking at the graph of this, we see initially we get high pellets, because that's what's right above the outlet. And then we start to get fewer pellets as more of those fines come in. Then we get more pellets because the pellets are now where we've em emptied that central column and the pellets are flowing better than the fines and then finally the fines come out. So 
different loading and unloading strategies uh, will make a difference. This top blue line the, with only 10% fines is very similar to the Turkey silo in Minnesota. And that was a side outlet silo, which is unusual. But uh, it had 10% fines, and there is very little segregation there. Um, I'm going to go ahead with the uh, rest of the presentation, and maybe we can come back to that uh, first video sometime. Okay, we're going to talk briefly about post-pelleting addition of liquids. And this is work done by uh, Dr. Joe Moritz in West Virginia, and I, I just really like it. Um, and I asked Joe if I could give it. Uh, um, what he did is uh, make a feed at a commercial pellet mill, and unfortunately they only had about 65% pellets when they added the liquid phytase on, 35% fines. They were shooting for 400, 400 units uh, of phytase per kilogram. They uh, measured the fines initially and then at the middle feeder and the final feeder. And um, at the middle feeder, they had only 37% pellets. So we're seeing something going on here. At the end feeder, we have 89% pellets. Now, looking at the phytase amount, the pellets at the mill had 160 units, but the fines had 860 units. So the fines have absorbed more liquid than the pellets, simply because of surface area. Um, this is the same if we add fat onto fines uh, or onto mixed feeds. You know, the, the fines will absorb more fat. Then when we get down to the middle feeder, the pellets have about the same amount of phytase, but the phytase in the fines has reduced. Well. That's not really possible. What's happened here is this shows that pellets have been ground as they've moved down the feeder line so that now those fines contain some ground up pellets with the lower phytase level. Um, and we were targeting 400 units and we're getting 471 because we've got higher fines. In this last feeder we're getting only 200 units because we've ground up even more pellets so that our, our, our concentration of phytase in the pellets is similar but it's much lower in the fines. So we're only getting 200 units of phytase to this last feeder. I'm going to move ahead and uh, turn this over to Dr. Joe Moritz who's going to tell you more about segregation in these feeder lines and the importance of uh, pellet quality for broilers. There we go. Okay, so thanks, Tom. Uh, I'm going to talk a little bit about feed segregation at the barn and potential impact ultimately on the bird. Um, and I'd like to just take a minute and reiterate my background and my pedigree. Uh, I'm from western Pennsylvania. Uh, went to school at Washington and Jefferson College. Uh, earned a Bachelor's of Arts in Biology. Uh, left there and went to Ohio State University and studied poultry nutrition under Dr. David Latchaw. Uh, earned a Master's of Science degree, and then went to Kansas State University, uh, studied feed manufacture and nutrition under the tutelage of Drs. Scott Beyer, Bob Goodman, Susan Sun, and Keith Binky. I earned my PhD there, and then came almost full circle uh, back to the area that I grew up uh, and took a job at West Virginia University, and I've been at West Virginia University for the past 15 years. At West Virginia University, I have a three-way split appointment in research, teaching, and extension. Uh, my research program is predominantly associated with effects of feed manufacture, both nutritionally and uh, on feed form, and how that affects ultimately meat bird performance. We also study enzyme efficacy, antibiotic alternatives, and we dabble in organic production as well. I've got a teaching appointment uh, where I'm able to teach courses in nutrition, poultry production, and I even teach freshman and sophomore level students uh, companion animal science. Finally, I have an extension appointment, and that gives me an opportunity to work with regional uh, feed mills as well as uh, poultry integrators 
And then I also have an opportunity to work with young people in FFA and 4-H. It's a very uh, nice appointment. So the next slide just illustrates some of the graduate students that have worked and currently work in my laboratory. Uh, much of the data that I'm going to present to you today was associated with Masters of Science thesis projects as well as PhD dissertation projects. So I, I feel that it's important uh, to at least give credit uh, to these very hardworking students. Okay, so I would like to explain why it's important to understand how segregation of fines occurs during handling. And I believe that it is important because segregation can impact, one, uh, feed quality assurance at the poultry barn, so your assessment of the job that the feed mill is actually doing, and two, uh, ultimately feed segregation can affect bird performance, whether that be on the nutritional side or on the feed form side uh, presented to the birds. So first, I would like to tell you about a situation that I was involved in where there was a discrepancy between a commercial feed mill and a turkey producer in regard to crumble quality. The deal was that the turkey producer wanted a very high quality crumble produced by the commercial feed mill. Uh, so the goal was to produce a crumble with less than 10% fines. Um, However, when the turkey company uh, went out into the field and took feed samples in the barn, uh, they found that the crumble quality was low and there was an excess of fines uh, in those particular samples. So I, I began uh, my visit at the feed mill and we looked at production records and we looked at techniques and methodologies and certainly it was my uh, conclusion that the feed mill was doing an outstanding job producing very high quality pellets and subsequent crumbles. So we followed feed out into the field and looked at some of the barns where there were some complaints associated uh, with those particular barns. So this is a slide which illustrates uh, two pictures and these are pictures of clear boots associated with two different bins uh, at the barn. So the bin or the clear boot on the left illustrates uh, crumbles that were currently being fed into the barn and the picture on the right illustrates a bin uh, or a boot, a clear boot on a bin uh, that had new crumbles recently delivered to the farm. So right off the bat, we see a difference uh, in crumble quality. You can see the picture on the left uh, definitely has more fines associated with that particular crumble uh, than the picture on the right. And this would go back to Tom's demonstration and Tom's data uh, demonstrating that at the end of these runs, as feed flows through the bin, uh, there is an accumulation of fine material. So we knew there were issues uh, at the onset. Upon walking into the barn, uh, we took different samples. We took some samples from the fill pipe uh, associated with the interior hopper, and then we took samples at the first feed pan in one particular line, uh, the last feed pan in that particular line, a middle pan, and then two intermediate pans. And what you can see uh, from this illustration is that sample from the feed pipe, uh, the crumbles contained 11% fines. And this, again, was likely associated with segregation in the bin. Uh, so the feed mill could have been producing a fantastic crumble quality, uh, but due to that segregation, we see that we exceed that 10% fine goal. You also see that as we convey feed through the line, through that ribbon in the barn, uh, we see that the percentage of fines is initially high and then decreases uh, as feed is conveyed down the line. And this was very similar uh, to the data that Tom presented uh, in regard to the broiler uh, production facility uh, in pellet flow. But it is interesting that uh, this particular feed pan uh, had a fine percentage of 40%. So in addition to taking these samples, we also took some pictures. Uh, and then uh, through looking at some of these pictures, it was obvious that we had an issue. Uh, so this picture uh, here, the pan with all the poults surrounding the pan, uh, would be consistent with that 40% fine pan. And what happened in this situation was that this particular pan, uh, whether it be an equipment malfunction or some type of management issue, uh, that pan was set to flood. 
and the volume of feed delivered to that particular fan, pan was higher uh, relative to other pans. So this, of course, attracted poults uh, to feed on this pan. We also noticed a lot more feed wastage around the pan, and certainly these poults would have a preference to consume the crumbles, uh, thus increasing the percentage of finds at that particular pan. Uh, so we see from this data set uh, that both conveyance of the feed through the line uh, causes segregation between crumbles and fines, and also bird feeding behavior can exacerbate uh, crumble spillage and crumble selection. Next, we wanted to look at samples without the bias uh, of the birds. Uh, so we emptied those pans, we caused the last pan to call for feed, and then took some samples again. Uh, once again, we found that at the fill pipe with the interior hopper, uh, we were able to get 11% fines. Again, I attribute this back to segregation in the bin. And then we see from the first pan, 13% fines to the middle pan, 9% fines, and then the end pan, 5% fines. So once again, we see that conveyance uh, is causing more of the fines to fall out early on and the crumbles to flow better to the end of the feeding line. So the percentage of fines again decreased as feed was augured down the line. So I believe that these data uh, provide a good example, a good illustration that segregation of feed at the farm can impact the perception of the quality of feed produced at the mill. So despite the mill doing a fantastic job of producing very high quality crumbles, based on where that field test was taken and based on bird feeding pressure, uh, there could be a bias. Uh, so segregation certainly was associated with bin loading, bin discharge, feed line augering, and bird feeding behavior. Okay, next I want to talk about how segregation during handling and bulk transport ultimately impact bird performance. And again, we have segregation associated with bin loading, bin discharge, and feed line augering, and this is going to dictate both variation in nutrients presented to the bird uh, as well as physical form presented to those birds. So Tom already discussed uh, that variation in phytase when we talk about post-pellet application of phytase, and certainly if we uh, consider, we, if the nutritionist was formulating a diet for 400 FTU per kilogram and counting on that enzyme to do its job in liberating phosphorus and providing that available phosphorus to the bird, uh, you can imagine that a difference between 400 and 200 FTU per kilogram uh, would be significant in terms of performance. Uh, but what I want to concentrate on would be the physical form of feed presented to the bird, so the pellet and fine ratio presented to the bird and how that ultimately impacts performance. And this is something that my lab has done for a long time now uh, in, in an attempt to demonstrate the importance of pellet quality. So we're interested in the physical form of feed, the amount of pellets, and the amount of fines presented to the bird, uh, and we believe that this does have overall economic implications. So pelleting, feeding high-quality pellets uh, provides several benefits. Uh, two of the major benefits uh, that I believe are associated with feeding high-quality pellets or a greater percentage of pellets to the bird uh, would be an increase in feed intake, uh, which would coincide with a subsequent increase in live weight gain, uh, as well as an increase in productive energy. And I'm defining productive energy uh, as a situation where a bird is going to spend less time eating and more time resting, and ultimately this bird is going to have additional energy to put forth towards productive purposes such as muscle tissue accretion. And uh, this concept is very well demonstrated by work from McKinney, uh, Leland McKinney and Bob Teeter out of Oklahoma State University, uh, and this data was presented in Poultry Science in 2004. And what these authors did uh, was they took variations in pellets and fines and presented those to birds. Uh, so they had all ground pellets where we would have 0% whole pellets in a diet, uh, then 20% pellets, 40% pellets, 60, 80, and 100% pellets, and then they observed these birds over a period of time and recorded the resting frequency. And as you can see, as the percentage of pellets increased uh, in the feed pan, these birds were able to spend more time resting, and the idea would be if you would spend more time resting, then more of that energy, more of that nutrition would be available for productive pur purposes uh, such as growth, uh, and breast tissue accretion, which would be very important in broiler uh, and turkey production. So my lab, uh, we believe that when you pellet feed, you've got two 
overall results. Uh, one, you ma manipulate feed form. You manipulate pellet quality, the percentage of pellets and the percentage of fines. Uh, and number two, you can manipulate nutrient availability based on the techniques that you use to pelletize your feed. So whenever we do a study uh, where we're going to focus just on feed form, it's very important that we hold nutrient availability constant. And much of the past literature has some issues with this, and, and I think that's why some of the past literature is confusing. Uh, so in this particular study, and this is from Mark Lemons and published in 2015, uh, we made all of our feed using the same technique. So same conditioning temperature, same throughput, uh, same dye specification, same cooling, etc. Um, we either left that feed intact for one treatment or we took a portion of that feed and ran it back through a roller mill or a hammer mill and then mixed it back with those original pellets to create a different treatment in terms of feed form. And in that way we can create variations of feed form but we hold nutrient availability constant. Hopefully that makes sense. Uh, in this particular study we're feeding uh, Hubbard by Cobb straight run broilers. Okay, there we go. So uh, in this particular study, we're looking at the difference between feeding 40% pellets at the feed pan uh, to 70% pellets at the feed pan. And our contention is this would have an economic impact. And we would describe this as a modest improvement in pellet quality. So what we saw uh, was that birds, broilers fed, the 70% pellets at the feed pan had a significantly improved live weight gain compared to broilers fed the 40% pellets at the feed pan. And we concentrate oftentimes on this small broiler uh, reared for about 38 days. This is something, uh, this is a bird type that's very important in West Virginia. Uh, but you can see 102 gram improvement in weight gain. In addition to that improvement in weight gain, uh, we see that those broilers fed the 70% pellets at the feed pan had a 2.6 point decrease in feed conversion ratio relative to broilers fed 40% pellets uh, at the feed pan. So certainly this would have some economic implications. Here's another study, uh, and this was done by Brian Glover and published in 2015. Uh, and once again, we used one technique, uh, made all of our feed, we ground a portion of that uh, pelleted feed, mixed it back with the original pellets, and we're able to create our feed form variations. Uh, once again, we were feeding Hubbard by Cobb straight run broilers. What's different about this study is we're looking at a smaller improvement in pellet quality. So we're looking at uh, feeding 50% pellets at the feed pan compared to 70% pellets at the feed pan. And despite this only being a 20 percentage point improvement in pellet quality, we believe that it has uh, importance in, in terms of overall economics. So in this study, with that smaller improvement, we see that feed intake is actually decreased for those broilers fed that improved quality pellet, that 70% uh, pellet at the feed pan. But despite that decrease in feed intake, uh, the birds were able to maintain similar weight gain uh, up to 38 days of age. So despite feeding the 50% pellets in the feed pan or the 70% pellets of the feed pan, uh, we had similar weight gain. So, of course, if you're going to consume less feed and gain the same amount of weight, we're going to see an advantage in terms of feed conversion ratio. And uh, here we see a three-point advantage uh, in feed conversion ratio for those broilers fed the 70% pellets at the feed pan uh, compared to broilers fed 50% pellets at the feed pan. So it's an interesting data set. Um, it's a little different uh, than what we saw with the first study. And we believe some of those differences are associated with, number one, uh, that variation in percent pellet improvement. Uh, but number two, we believe that it's dependent on energy. And we think energy is an important variable to look at when considering uh, pelleting improvements. So uh, this next study, this is pretty hot off the press, very new data. Uh, we've had a couple abstracts presented on this, but we have not yet published this paper. Uh, and it's a little bit more complex. So same general concept, we're going to focus on feed form, we're going to hold nutrient availability constant, and we're going to look at Hubbard by Cobb straight run broilers. Uh, in this particular study, we ran a split plot, two by two factorial arrangement, 
And what's most interesting is that this study was replicated three times. So we ran this study back to back to back. So you've got a lot of numbers uh, associated with the statistical analysis. So split plot in terms of environment. We try to create a variation in energy need for the bird in terms of using energy for an immune response. So we fed birds either on clean shavings or on buildup litter. Uh, we looked at two different feed Form, similar to the past two studies that I demonstrated. Here we're looking at 30% crumbles or pellets at the feed pan compared to 80% crumbles or pellets at the feed pan, so a little wider range uh, than the previous studies. Uh, and then we also looked at two different uh, levels of energy, and this is metabolizable energy in the diet, so the way that the diets were formulated. Uh, and once again, we believe that this improvement does have economic implications. So the two diets, uh, this, this cartoon does a little better job of demonstrating the, the complexity of the treatment structure, uh, but there were two diets uh, that varied in metabolizable energy by 110 kcals per kilogram. Uh, the diets were either steam conditioned, pelleted, and left alone, and that's what resulted in our 80% pelleted treatment, uh, or a portion of that diet was ground through our hammer mill, remixed with the original pellets, and that produced what we called our standard feed form, or our low quality pellets, uh, that were 30% pellets and 70% fines. Uh, we then fed these diets uh, of different energy and different feed form quality to birds that were raised either on clean shavings or birds that were raised on build up litter. And once again, the idea was to focus on energy, whether the energy be in the diet formulation or the energy be associated with expenditure for an immune response. So once again, I want to reiterate this was uh, three studies, back to back to back, a lot of data, and overall we saw a main effect of feed form, uh, where the broilers in general that were fed the 80% pellets in the feed pan demonstrated a two-point advantage in feed conversion ratio compared to broilers fed 30% pellets or crumbles uh, at the feed pan. In addition to this benefit in feed conversion ratio, we also saw an improvement in live weight gain. And here we're looking at an interaction, and this was an environment by feed form interaction. Uh, so if we focus our attention on the left side of the graph, these would be broilers that were reared on clean shavings. Uh, the yellow would represent that standard quality or 30% pellet, and the red would represent the improved quality or 80% pellet uh, at the feed pan. And we can see that we get a 180 gram improvement uh, by feeding that improved quality diet. But if we focus our attention to the right side of the the graph and we look at broilers that were reared on build-up litter, uh, we can also see an improvement and here we're looking at a 140 gram improvement, but this uh, improvement is less in magnitude uh, than that on the clean shavings. And likely the association here is that in increased uh, immune system, uh, upregulation of the immune system rather, and uh, the student had, had performed some work and we saw things like IgG and some other markers of immunity uh, that were upregulated for these particular birds, so it seemed to, to work out well. But what I find most interesting about this particular study is when we look at contrast of particular treatments. So with this being a split plot, two by two factorial, we've got eight different uh, treatments. And two that I think are very interesting would be to compare uh, the low quality pellet, so the 30% pellet, uh, with the the higher energy level, so this is 30% pellets, the yellow bar, with 30 to 40 kcals per kilogram, and compare that to the 80% pellets and 3130 kcal per kilogram. And here we're looking at live weight gain. And you can see that despite uh, there being this 110 kcal per kilogram difference in energy, birds consuming that higher quality pellet were able to eat more, uh, compensate for that energy deficiency, and grow to a larger live weight. And you can see they have a 170 gram increase uh, in live weight gain per bird. Now, if we look at the uh, graph on the right, you can see we're looking at those same treatments, 30% pellets with the high energy, 3240, compared to the 80% pellets at the lower energy of 3130, but this time we're looking at the build-up litter uh, situation, and we also see this improvement in live weight gain, and now we're looking at 140 grams of improvement. So uh, despite being lower in energy, uh, the improvement in pellet quality allow these particular birds to consume more feed and gain a greater amount of weight. And I think that's very interesting. Uh, 
Uh, the other reason that I think this is so interesting is that it coincides very well with that data set from McKinney and Teeter uh, published in Poultry Science. And this is that same data set that I showed you before, but in addition uh, we have this blue line, and this blue line uh, represents uh, a variable that McKinney and Teeter called the effective caloric value of pelleted feed. So these authors tried to ascribe uh, a calorie value uh, to improvements in pellets presented to the bird. So essentially what, they, what they're saying is that with every 10% increase in pellets presented to the bird, you get an additional 18.7 kcals per kilogram. And if we go from 0% pellets or all ground pellets up to 100% pellets, uh, this of course would be 187 kcals per kilogram of additional energy. And I think these d data coincide very well uh, with the study that I, that I just showed you in, in the previous slide. Um, this, this data set uh, that we're looking at here is much more theoretical in nature and uh, my previous data set is much more applied, uh, but, but it, they seem very much consistent. So the take-home message today, at least for me, uh, would be that pellet and fine segregation does in fact occur during feed handling. And when it does occur, this affects quality assessment and it also can affect bird performance. And I think it's very important for all of us to, to have this take-home message and realize that segregation does occur uh, and we should not uh, wrongfully accuse uh, the feed mill of doing a poor job in, in manufacturer feed because really it could be a situation uh, just associated with sample error. Uh, and then it's important to recognize that, that bird performance can be significantly affected both by nutrient segregation as well as feed form segregation. Uh, so how do we combat this? Well, first, I believe we need to know that it happens. And second, uh, one way to combat it would be to improve pellet quality uh, in the first place and feed pellets uh, of higher composition, uh, have a, a greater uh, production of high quality pellets uh, produced at the mill, and this should lessen detrimental effects of segregation. Okay, thank you very much. All right, thank you, Joe. So we will be circling back around to the aforementioned video, but first we would like to introduce our poll question to the audience. So our poll question today is, do you agree with this statement? Fines segregation can have a significant negative impact on animal performance. Please select one. All right, don't forget to take a couple of minutes to answer our short survey at the conclusion of our webinar. Also, please note that if you would like to download a copy of the speaker presentations, please visit response.lignotechfeed.com forward slash webinar dash watt agnet dash free presentations. So we are going to um, circle back to our Q&A session after the video, and we do have a lot of great questions that have come through. So um, now I'll hand it over and we will run that video. Hello, so I guess this is dessert. Um, here we have a, uh, a video where we've uh, uh, filled a silo with pellets containing 20% fines, center loaded, and we've built a central column of fines. And this might be similar to a counterflow cooler uh, emptying into a holding bin. We're going to empty that uh, central column of fines out first and only have about 65% pellets. And then that's going to be followed by the pellets on the outside. Here we see it unloading again from the center. The fines are coming down, the cone is now inverting, and the pellets are rolling down into that vortex. You can see that last bit of fines disappearing as clean pellets are following it. We're unloading 60% fines right now. <clears throat> and suddenly we move to 90% pellets. I'm at 60% pellets moving to 90% pellets. Again, notice the feed is on loading from the top of the bin, not the bottom. There's a website uh, listed on the screen, lignotechfeed.com, where you can actually review this video again 
and the quality will be a little bit better on that website. Now we finish unloading, we get a little bit of extra fines right at the end. Now that bin loaded into a second bin, maybe over a bagger or maybe it was a bulk truck, but you see that the fines are all down in the bottom. They came out first, they went into this bin first, and they're still in that central core. So when they come out, we're going to have less than 50% pellets. And, you know, when everything's above 90, your customers don't call you, but when they happen to look at the feed, when it's only got 50% pellets, that's when they pick up the phone. And even though you're making good quality pellets, this is how it occurs. That central column is coming out first. Now, all those fines are out. We've had 50% pellets, now we're up to 90% pellets again. You can see the pellets flowing into the top. This, this is why when people fall into a silo that's emptying, they, they die because they can't get out. As they try to swim out, they're just going right down into the center and pull down into the vortex. As we get down to the bottom, we're going to get a few more fines from that initial outlay from the first silo. And there we go. So we do a little recap here. We've got a series of photos across the top that's the first silo emptying, the middle row is the second silo receiving, and then the bottom row is the second silo emptying again. And you can see the plots on the right that show even though we've got 80% pellets, at some point we're going to deliver less than 50% pellets. That's when you get the phone call. That's what I really wanted to share with you, and I thank you for your attention. Great. Well, we'll open up the q and a segment of today's webinar. The first question we have is for Tom. Could you tell us how the NHP 100 pellet tester is different from the KSU tumbler? Uh, well, it's different in every way, <laughs> but the, there are two real significant ways. It only uses 100 grams of pellets instead of 500, and it tests in a much shorter time. I use it for 30 seconds whereas the tumbler takes 10 minutes. So it's, it's faster and uses less sample. And it's more destructive. Great. And why did you use rabbit pellets? Is that a big market? No. Well, they, they do use a lot of a binder in rabbit pellets because pellet quality is very important. But the rabbit pellets were used uh, just to give a, a contrast in color for this demonstration. Great. This question is for Joe. There is some extra cost to making good quality pellets. Is there a savings in the reduced calorie formulation cost that can help to balance this? So, so sure, if you're referring specifically to the data set that, that I showed, um, the difference in metabolizable energy was associated with a 1.8% uh, change in liquid fat. So uh, just in, in theory, so that would be 36 pounds per ton. And if we're looking at corn oil prices of about 33 cents per pound, uh, then that difference would be uh, almost $12 per ton of feed, uh, just in that metabolizable energy difference. And uh, you know, as I, I demonstrated, uh, the lower energy feed uh, performed better uh, with the higher quality pellets. Excellent. And this question is, do you think there is the same problem of segregation with mash feed, Joe? I, I think there could be depending on the grind size of your cereal. So I think much of the segrega segregation data that has been published uh, has been associated with um, layer production. So if we're looking at uh, large grind size on corn, Corn, uh, or even large particle size with limestone, uh, there has been some percolating effects that have been noted uh, with, with mash feed. Right. And this question's for Tom. How can one avoid the center column empty? 
Well, the uh, presentation did show um, pellets shot over to the side, and that was actually a little bit better. Uh, center uh, load is probably uh, not as common. There's always some air that's going to go to one side or another. Uh, the best way to do it would be to get a homogeneous uh, distribution of fines throughout your silo and, and that would be to put a spreader at the end of the spout but if you go through one silo without a spreader you've got segregation so it's not realistic to think that would happen at every location especially on the farm. And this question is for Joe. In regards to the study comparing 50% pellets to 70%, how much of the reduction in consumption could be attributed to lower waste? So that, that's a good question. Um, you know, we do the best we can to, to try to limit that from happening. Uh, so that's the advantage of having graduate students. Uh, you know, you have them in the barns as, as much as possible. They're constantly uh, raising the feeder. Uh, lip level to the bird back level, so you're doing everything in your power to eliminate uh, feed wastage. And if that does occur, then we try to to make note of that. Uh, but in the past studies that we've had, we we've, we've never, at least, been able to observe that um, you know visually that, that we had issues. But uh, you know, point well taken. Uh, that can be part of it. And this question is also for you, Joe. Have you done any work on pellet degradation from unloading of feed from the delivery truck? No. So, um, you know, Tom showed some of that data uh, where we followed feed in, in that particular study where he, he demonstrated the, the phytase uh, change as, as feed was augered down the line. So that in that data set, we took samples as feed was being loaded onto the truck and then uh, we followed that feed to the field, uh, gave it a few days so that we knew that feed would be in the bin uh, and then being augered to the birds and, and looked at it that way. Uh, that's, that's as much as I've done. Okay, and this question is for Tom. In the fines flow through the bin, how much change in fines filtering would occur in mass flow bins? If it's a, if it's a true mass flow bin, um, you're going to have the central column of fines still or on the right or left. Wherever the fines land in the bin, uh, they will stay in that spot. But if it's a true mass flow bin, that uh, should remove uh, the fines from the bottom of the bin and carry them out evenly, and you would see um, little or no segregation, in my opinion. But it depends on the bid. And this question is for either one of you, um, and we kind of touched on, on grind earlier, but within the industry we are seeing nutritionist emphasis moving toward coarser grain grinds and inclusion of whole or low processed materials. How does this impact segregation at the farm and pellet durability? I um, have looked at this uh, a lot in uh, journal articles and I don't think that grind is very important. It's a minor factor for pellet durability and that goes against common belief but uh, when we actually look at it and measure it it's not a very important factor for pellet durability. Now when you put in whole grain um, I've, I've been in places where they put whole milo in the mix and that just comes right out it, the, because the seed shell doesn't bind to anything so there you've got potential for segregation if you were to put whole wheat in it would grind itself in the die roller face um, I don't I, I really think coarser grind is is good and doesn't do much harm to pellet quality yeah, I, I just want to follow that up. I, I believe Tom's absolutely correct. Anecdotally, uh, we've always thought that large particle size uh, would be very detrimental to, to pellet quality, uh, but I've got some recent data sets that would suggest that's not the case. Uh, and I, I agree that I think most nutritionists, if you're talking corn soy based diets, uh, you know, you want at least an 800 micron corn particle size, maybe up to 1,000 microns. And I don't believe that that. Uh, has has shown to be very detrimental in terms of pellet quality 
and then the advantages certainly outweigh uh, any small change in pellet quality because uh, you know with gizzard stimulation and anti-peristaltic contractions and better lysine retention and better protein digestibility uh, there's a lot of advantages to a little bit larger uh, cereal particle size. And the next question is would fine segregation also occur with extruded or expanded feed? If there's a difference in particle size there will be segregation. If you have large and small particles there will be segregation. And then the follow-up question from this attendee is for Tom. What then would be the best way to load the silo to prevent segregation of fines? Well, that's a good question. <laughs> on the cheap, I would load it on the side so that when I unloaded it, I'd get, uh, I'd get a mixture of fines and pellets, as you said. There's, uh, there are devices you can put in the bottom of the silo uh, deflectors or Chinaman's hats that uh, spread, that actually expand that opening and give you a larger central column. Um, if you put some kind of diverter uh, on the inlet or, or let's say the, the spout coming that's delivering the feed so it would spread uh, the pellets and the fines equally across the top, that would be an excellent way. And this question is for Joe for poultry. Or, or you oh, could just use really good pellet quality. That's what we want you to do. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> and then this question is for Joe. For poultry, can we put a standard value that for every 10% improvement in PDI, you get about approximately 0 0.09 reduction in FCR? Well, I, I think it's you know it, it's slightly more complicated than that um, I think we've got to address this this energy relationship and um, you know what type of stress are these be these birds reared under um, and then you know sometimes you see less of an effect on FCR and you see more of an effect on improved intake and improved gain uh, so I, I think we still have a little bit to figure out uh, for these birds um, but but in particular studies I, I've done just that and I, I have attributed that that same value uh, approximately but I, I think it is slightly more complex okay. and this questions for Tom how effective are some of the mechanical devices that can be placed at the bottom of bins to counteract the effects of bulk bins being emptied as described well I can't speak to all of those uh, but as I said if you have a, a, a deflector over that bottom opening that would cause feed to flow out to the outsides. That essentially, what I showed you was, was one very small opening and all the feed uh, came down through that. If you put a deflector on top of that so that the feed would have to flow outward and then back down, that essentially makes that central column larger. But it, you still got feed that will be on the outside of the bins, uh, it just makes it a larger central column, which is good. Excellent. And this will be our final question today, and this can be for both of you. Which part of the journey from feed mill to bird is most detrimental to pellet quality? <laughs> I, I, in my, my opinion is uh, you can do a lot of damage in the truck if you um, have a small auger and uh, you're in a hurry to unload the truck um, you could do a lot of grinding there. Um, John DeYoung at uh, Kansas State University has uh, followed the feed through the mill and into the truck and uh, he got maybe uh, no additional fines through the cooler 5% fines up through the fat coater, another 5% fines into the truck, and he stopped measuring there. So that seems reasonable to me, but I'd be careful about running fast through small augers. That's where it gets ground up. And, and I just want to agree with Tom um, and, and reiterate that I think that there can be a lot of damage at the feed mill itself, uh, you know, depending on what type of 
post pellet liquid applicator system you use. Uh, some of those uh, dual auger systems uh, can be very detrimental in pellet quality. Uh, so you're really hurting yourself before you even load it onto a truck. Well, excellent. This concludes our Q&A session. I'd like to first thank all of our attendees for taking the time to listen to today's webinar. As I mentioned earlier, a recorded archive will be made available at www.wattagnet.com forward slash webinars. And for anybody who had an issue viewing the video, the archived version will in fact have the videos embedded. Um, and those will be available in the next few days. Um, don't forget, you can also register for upcoming Watt webinars or watch on-demand webinars of related topics in the same location on the website. And please note that the speaker presentations are available for download. Please visit response.lignatechfeed.com forward slash webinar dash wattagnet dash free dash presentations to download your copy of the speaker presentations today. Thank you again to our sponsors, Beauregard Lignatech. For additional information on the company's other products and services, please visit www.lignatechfeed.com. Please remember to take a couple of minutes at the end of this presentation to answer the short survey. And finally, we'd like to extend a huge thanks to our speakers for their time today. Thanks again for joining us, and have a great day.